and uh, welcome to this next series of the Solvet team. And I am so excited to introduce you to a really awesome pioneer in the field of computer science. Her name is Batya Friedman. And I was very nervous when I reached out to her to see, to invite her to be part of the series. And when you said yes, I was like, that's awesome. And I'm just really, really happy that you agreed to do a fun workshop and spend a little afternoon with these girls and ideally uh, share some tips that um, Technovation girls all around the world can benefit because um, we want these girls to be rebels and change makers. And I, I want to see that basically bring the best understanding that we have so that whatever you create um, is really making an awesome change in the world because you girls are awesome. So, all right. Um, thank you, and over to you, Batya. Great. Well, hi, you guys. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here um, with you. I think it's very cool what you're doing. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, moral and technical imagination and what you guys can do with your own imaginations and give you some words to think with. And then we're going to do a design activity. So we'll actually you get your hands dirty. Um, but I started out when I went to the university, I studied, at, or studied out as a computer scientist and I love technology, I love building things, but I wanted to make sure that what I built was more likely to do something good in the world than not. And that is what has been motivating me for my whole career because I started looking around for tools like, how do you do that? And there wasn't a whole lot out there then. So, um, that's what I ended up doing, was trying to fill that gap, invent, invent things that would um, fill that space. But the first thing I want to talk about is um, moral imagination and technical imagination. So um, when, when I uh, say the words technical imagination, what do, what do you guys think about? What comes to your mind? It's very dreamy about technical stuff like, like coding and all those computer techie type stuff um i think about like like things that would be like in the future i guess like like oh like flying cars or like self-driving <laughs> cars or like really cool like tech that would help sometimes i think of like new versions of stuff and kind of like better or like how to make some tech things better great so now let's talk about this word moral um, I don't know, have you guys heard this word moral before? Is that familiar? The moral of the story? Yeah, something like that. And usually it's talking about doing things that will somehow result in something good or better in the world. So like, like a lesson? A little bit more like thinking about justice, like what's just or what's fair, or how do you help people thrive? How do you help people be really um, healthy and um, do kind things in the world. So when you think of words like justice or fairness or kindness, those are all the sorts of things that you think of when you're thinking about morality. So when we think about our moral imaginations, that's when we go about and we think about, oh, how could we do things so that they're really fair for everybody? Or, how do we do things so that people are treated kindly or so that we are gentle with people? Um, those are the kinds of things that are part of your moral imagination. And what I wanna talk about is how do we bring those two together? How do you make sure that when you build these really cool new technologies that they're gonna be fair for people and they're gonna make our world more just? or they're gonna treat people more gently or more kindly? How do we make sure that what we build contributes to that kind of world that we might wanna live in? So I'm gonna read you something. Um, it comes from that book um, that uh, Tara was just showing you, and it's the very, very beginning of the book. It's actually the very first words of the book. And it uh, starts with a quote from Rabindranath Tagore, and I'm going to read you the quote from Tagore, and then I'm going to tell you what this quote means to me. And then you'll see how that shows something about what moral imagination and technical imagination are when they work together. So this is Tagore, and he is writing in 1922. 
And Tagore says, the water vessel, taken as a vessel only, raises the question, why does it exist at all? Through its fitness of construction, it offers the apology for its existence. But where it is a work of beauty, it has no question to answer. It has nothing to do but to be. So what I want to say about that is that in those few words, Tagore is gently pointing us to what we call the human condition. What does it mean to be a human being? And we learn from Tagore that being with our tools, that all of our tools, all of our technologies have us think not only about functionality, how something works, that the vessel holds water, but also about human flourishing. I mean, what does it really mean to live a rich life and to be a person who, you know, enjoys all the different parts of themselves and can be really generous with other people? How do we flourish? And we might say, if we're telling Tagore's story, that every human being is entitled to clean water to drink and a vessel from which to drink that water. And that vessel should be beautiful. So let's just think about that for a minute. Do you guys all think that everybody should have clean water to drink? Yeah. 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 Me yeah. too. I do too. I think everybody's entitled to clean water to drink. So when we design things, when we're builders and designers, we need to get the functionality in there, right? We don't want to have a container with holes in it. That's not going to let us drink the water. Um, but we also want it to be really beautiful. And when you guys are designing your technologies, the challenge is to think about what do people need? What do they need to do? And then how do you make them flourish while they're doing it? So with that, I want to give you guys five words, five ideas to think with that you can use in your design work. Are you ready for those? Yeah. Okay. Here's the first one. It says stakeholder. And what a stakeholder is, is a person who has a stake in something, who cares about something. So here's my cell phone and I care about it, right? Because it's mine. But maybe there are a whole bunch of other people who care about it like the cell phone companies care about it too, right? Because they're providing the cell services. So they're also stakeholders. And when we design a technology, we have to think not just about the person using it, but about a whole group of people, a lot of people. So the reason I like this word stakeholder is it gets me to think bigger than just the person who's using it. Okay, that's word number one. Now, word number two, it's related to stakeholder. It's this word, direct stakeholder. It's actually two words, right? Direct stakeholder is kind of like your user, because I want a way when I'm designing something to be able to talk about the person who's really going to touch that technology, right? So that's my cell phone. Um, and so I'm the direct stakeholder. So usually when you think about users, that's what I mean by a direct stakeholder. I'm going to give you one more word because, and then I think it's going to make our conversation even more interesting. So this is also a two word word, indirect stakeholders. Our stakeholders are getting more and more broader. So remember when I have my cell phone, maybe you've been like this where you've been um, with your friends and then somebody gets a call and they pick up their phone and they start talking on their phone and you're sitting there listening to their phone conversation, you are an indirect stakeholder. You sure are affected by this technology, even though it doesn't even belong to you, right? So it's really helpful to talk about all these people and when you're designing to be thinking about all these different people. But would, be, would like a support staff or like, like a mailman be an indirect stakeholder? Well, it depends what technology you're talking about. But let me give you an example that might help you think with this. And it used to be um, when you would go to the doctor and, you know, the doctor would take notes about you, about whatever, maybe they took your temperature, maybe they measured your height, and they would put it in what's called a medical record, a record about you, right? And they would keep that in the doctor's office. And the next time you would come back, like a year later to get checked up, they had those records from the year before, right? Well, 
The doctor sees those records, the nurse in the office might, maybe an insurance company, but you as the patient never see the medical records about you. You have to actually ask. Some of that's changing now, but that's a case where those medical records, their information about me and they're about my body, but I actually never see that information and I don't touch the technology that's collecting and storing that. So I would be an indirect stakeholder. I care an awful lot about it, <laughs> but I'm not touching it. So it's a way of talking about people who are affected by a technology you're designing, but they may actually not be touching or using the technology. So the other concept I wanna give you is this one. It's called widespread use. So what do I mean by this? Well, usually when people are designing a technology, they're thinking about one person like me with my cell phone. But what we don't often think about is what happens if you know a million people start using your technology all at once. It's the difference between one person having a cell phone and then now you go to the street, you know, you hang out at your playground or you go, um, you know, to the shopping somewhere and you just see everybody is walking with their cell phones and they don't make eye contact with anyone anymore. And we changed our whole society because everybody is using it. So how, when we design a technology, can we think or anticipate, think in the future, what would it be like if everybody had it? So that's what widespread use is about. Okay, I'm gonna give you one last one, and then we're gonna to wanna to, um, try out some of these things. Uh, so here's the last one, and this one is called materiality. It's probably not a word you've heard before. You've probably heard the word material. Do you know what material means? What does material stand for? Material means like something that you can use. Yeah, the shorthand word for material is stuff. <laughs> stuff, it's your stuff. So here's my cell phone again. Um, such a good example for us. What's the um, stuff here? Glass. There's some glass, yep. There's probably some glass there. Batteries and wires. What are those batteries made out of anyways? Metal. Yeah. yeah, some metal. Think about how many people do you think have cell phones? A lot of people. <laughs> yeah, what happens if we took everybody's cell phone and we just stacked them on top of each other? How high do you think that would be? Like how much material have we all got on the planet because we all have these cell phones? So let me tell you something else about the material part of these. Um, it's not just them, right? But to use my cell phone or to use the internet, we have to have a whole lot of cables, right? That connect us. And then have you guys heard about the cloud, storing data in the cloud? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a place where you store data, but it's really not a cloud in the sky somewhere. It's really a bunch of huge computers, huge servers that take up football fields. <laughs> So all of this technology, it looks so small and slim in my hand, but actually to really use it requires a huge amount of um, material from the earth. And not only that, it requires a lot of energy because I expect to use this 24 seven, right? And it generates a lot of heat and that requires a lot of energy to cool. So this tiny little phone that you think is so innocuous that you carry in your pocket, is actually using a huge amount of materials and energy from the earth. And when we design things, we have to think about that. Like, um, what happens if the thing that I build gets used by everyone, like 4 billion people or however many, right? What will that mean for the amount of energy, the amount of water? Um, how is that all gonna work, right? Is using my technology going to mean that I'm taking water? So let's go back to that clean water to drink. I really wanted that clean water to drink, but now I'm using all my water to um, cool all these servers. And also I've got all of these heavy metals in here, you know, and putting toxins into the water. What happened to my nice 
vessel to hold clean water that I said everybody was entitled to have. So when we're designing and building technologies, part of our moral imagination is thinking ahead to all of those things and really taking that into account so the things we build are really going to help people overall. All right, so that's a lot. Um, those were just five little words, five little concepts. I put them all here on one page. And now I have to tell you a secret. <laughs> I lied when I said that there were five. There's actually six. And the sixth one is maybe the most important one. Uh, it's this one. It says progress, not perfection. Because, you know, trying to get it all right is just really, really hard. How do we build a technology that's really fair? Well, we don't know how to do that. How do we build one where it's really going to work well for the environment? We don't always know that in advance. So the really important thing is, is that we try. We have to be content with making progress. And we can't get held up on perfection. If we get held up on perfection, we won't do anything. We'll be so worried about all the things that could go wrong that we won't take steps to make things better. So you have to be gentle on yourself and um, think about all of these things, take them into account, and then do the best job that you can and stay alert. So make progress. Don't worry about the perfection part. And then, you know, if you make mistakes, well, you can go back and you can fix them, right? Just like if you were doing a really hard math problem, right? If it's really hard, you might not get it right the first time, but you would just try. You'd make some progress, you'd learn some things, and then you'd go back and try again. So it's the same thing. When we're building things, the moral part can feel really hard, even harder than the technology part. <laughs> but we wanna make progress on it, not perfection. Yeah, Mia. Yeah, so I have another question. I think I'm um, like pretty on like the perfection side, but... Yeah. Um, I was wondering, like, do you have any tips that could, like, help? Well, I'm kind of on the perfection side, too. I really love excellence. Like, I love beauty. And, and that means that you kind of got all the pieces working. But let's say you never got started because it wasn't quite beautiful, right? Like, the way you move towards beauty is by starting and then walking around it and looking at it and thinking, oh, okay, this part's really pretty good, but this part, mm, not so much yet. Let me improve that part, right? Like this paragraph in my book, or maybe I need a new section. And then you keep continuing to work on it and refine it and slowly move it to that place that's excellent or beautiful. So the progress, not perfection part is not to get so hung up about getting it perfect, that you never get started and that you never keep working it, you know, and you, you just say, okay, I did a good job today because I wrote that paragraph and that's better than without that paragraph in it. And then you can pat yourself on the back and get a good night's sleep and go out and play, run around for a while. And the next day you can pick it up again and look for, well, what's the next paragraph I need to write or what sentence do I need to fix? Yeah. 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 That's a great question. Thank you.